Who would have thought that affordable housing would be an issue dramatic enough for an HBO miniseries? Back in 1999, New York Times journalist Lisa Belkin wrote a book called Show Me a Hero about low-income housing being forced on the city of Yonkers during the 80s and 90s. The drama of that period and all the fears and tensions caught up in mixing low-income housing into a wealthier neighborhood played out again this summer in the HBO six-part miniseries of the same title. Let's turn our attention to the screen now for a short clip of HBO's Show Me a Hero. The Yonka City Council is now in session. Mr. Clark. It's now my pleasure to welcome Lisa Belkin, now Yahoo News Chief National Correspondent, author, and HBO miniseries consultant of Show Me a Hero, and back again, my colleague, the Atlantic's Washington editor-at-large, Steve Clemens. Thank you. I promise this is the last time. <laughs> um, Lisa, what, what a weird thing that HBO made a thing about the city, I mean, I, I, how, did, how does you this done for their you ratings? You don't think public housing policy in Yonkers <laughs> is the usual fare for, you know, TV miniseries? No, it, it is surprising. <laughs> tell, tell me about filming this. Well, people keep, kept asking me, you know, did you expect this? I'm like, of course I didn't expect this. What kind of subject is this for a, public, for a, a miniseries? And it took um, 16 years from when the book came out to when the miniseries came out. That particular scene, I spent uh, probably too much time if my, my day job bosses knew about it on the set watching some of these things. In that particular scene, it was hot as hell in there, which it was in the original, you know, the, the original day that this happened were in August. You were chronic, so, just to set the stage for everyone here, yes. you were chronicling this in real time. I was not in chronicling what, okay. it in real time. Yeah. I came into it in episode five, oh, um, which was the city of Yonkers had a lottery to decide who got these townhouses once right. they were finally built. So during the days of contempt mm -hmm. um, in August of 88, I was living in Texas. 1988, I just want people to understand what year we're talking That's, about. Yes, yeah. so 1988, the, should we start backward for a moment? So 27 yes. years later. So in 1980, the um, HUD, and the NAACP sued the city of Yonkers and said, you have been taking federal money that was designated for public housing around Yonkers and you have been putting all, deliberately, putting all of your low income minority housing in one square mile, basically six blocks of downtown Yonkers. And you can't do that, the lawsuit said. And so they, the remedy as determined by a federal judge who found that Yonkers had deliberately, I mean, they left a paper trail that was stunning mm. um, that said, you know, we don't want them here, so we will put them there. And the, a federal judge said, okay, the remedy is 200 units of low income housing and 800 units of affordable housing on the mostly white, mostly middle class side of Yonkers. And there was a school piece with this, and interestingly, the school piece settled almost immediately, as opposed to the rest of the country, which was at mm. war over school desegregation. And in Yonkers, they fought the housing. And they fought it for eight years in the courts until finally a judge found them in contempt and said there will be fines now of $100 a day, doubling every day, capping at a million dollars, and essentially that would have wiped out the entire budget of the city of Yonkers mm. in 21 days. So what you see here is one of the meetings where the mayor is trying to get the rest of the city council 
to agree to build 200 units of housing in a city of 200,000 people, and that was the outrage. So a good guy who's destroying his political career. Well, a good guy. Um, he's a very, very complicated guy, and it mm. takes you know a 400-page book and a six-part miniseries to discuss how complicated. But he was he wanted to be mayor, and so he rode this hatred into mm. office, and then realized oh, I have no options, we have to implement this. And then he actually, I would argue, became a leader and, mm. and did the right thing. But he didn't do it because he was, you know. But this sat for 27 years, um, essentially. The, the story sat. Yeah, the story sat. You wrote your piece, it still sat yes. for a while. And as you've written, I, I, I've been reading comments that you've made that said, one, you were surprised that the Yonkers thing didn't happen in lots of other places in the country, you're surprised. Right. But at the same time, this is more resonant today given some of the so new things. So this was supposed to be a first. This yeah. lawsuit was supposed to be a template. And this would, because Yonkers is not the only city in the country, Lord knows, that mm -hmm. took money and used it in ways it wasn't <laughs> supposed to and actively placed its low-income housing in one part of town. Um, and. So this was to be, this was basically the low-hanging fruit. They were so obvious about it that this was going to be the first decision. And then HUD, with the, the partnership of the NAACP, mm -hmm. was going to, to roll it out elsewhere. And in effect, Yonkers was a victory mm -hmm. because the housing was built. And yet, the, the government backed off. Because it was so bruising. I mean, it was a Pyrrhic, true Pyrrhic victory. It was so bruising that nothing really happened. I mean, all of these rules were on the books for mm -hmm. the entire 27 years since. But no one fought to enforce it until very recently, this summer. Right. So I had this book that no one really read or paid much attention to when it came out. I would um, have. If, yes, uh, I, I, I know. Um, <laughs> and. I was in Japan when it came um, out. Uh, that, that was, yeah, it was so, actually yeah. in Japanese. You could have found it. Um, <laughs> and, you know, only David Simon uh, seems to have read it. And so he and HBO optioned it. And then every 18 months or so, I would hear from him because the option was up. And he would say, no, no, still working on it. And so he did The Wire. Mm. And then The Wire was over. And I thought it was my turn. And then. He, he did um, Generation Kill, and then that ended, and I thought, my, my turn, and then Treme. And you know, so when he finished Generation Kill, he said, well, I, I have to do that one now because this, the Iraq war won't be, you know, won't be current forever. Right. And post-Katrina New Orleans won't be current forever. But, but race, race will always be there. And so, and he was sadly right. It's but sad then, to say that, that race will always be there. But then there was this moment this summer. I mean, David mm -hmm. Simon is one lucky bastard because he, <laughs> if you could have crafted, sadly, mm -hmm. a context for a mini series about public and affordable housing to appear, if you were some sort of I don't know, nefarious PR firm, and you wanted to set the stage as best you could for this um, to get attention, you would have created the summer before it ran. Um, they, they started filming during Ferguson. They were editing during Baltimore. All the things the secretary was talking about, the, the, the Supreme Court decision, HUD's re affirmation that they were going to, to enforce law that had already existed, the Harvard Project. Um, and, and its findings that where a child lives mm -hmm. is the, the most crucial determinant zip, zip of code. future. Right, zip all, code futures. all of those things came out within that year. So this, this story that has always been true is now more resonant than it was when it happened or when I wrote it. But ha, ha, when you take a step back from what you wrote for a moment, and, and, I, and I don't know because we, we didn't pre plan this discussion, have you looked at other communities that either look like they're getting it all right, that they're healthy, they're, they've got their stakeholders, um, but, but that they actually change something? In other words, I'm always interested in this question of moving the needle on these what seem to be very insoluble questions. They can be, you know, uh, inequities in wealth. They can be redlining. They can, you know, ch cities or communities that fundamentally 
change in healthy ways. Have you seen any superstars out there? Well, ironically, Yonkers. Yonkers. Um, Yonkers yeah. now, I mean, people are always asking me, after they ask who's the hero, the next question is, well, is it working? And Yonkers worked. Now, it worked for an odd constellation of reasons. Partly it was because they were forced to do all of this. Partly it was because they then, once they were forced to do it, they actually did it well. Mm. Um, th when it was no longer in the hands of the politicians and it was given over to the bureaucrats. I mean, that's, that's one answer for who's the hero, mm. is the, the people who worked at many of these, you know, at the schools, at, at municipal housing, who had to enforce this, who had to make it so happen. So official institutions matter. And yes, yeah. hugely in this case. They had what arguably was a rather patronizing, and one would do it differently if you were to do it again, mm. but a program that, that very clearly took into account the fact that people were moving to a place that was foreign to them in that you know they didn't know the first thing about where the supermarket was or, or where the bus lines ran, or and they introduced and oriented them to the neighborhood, and they also prepared them as best they could for the hostility they were gonna face. And they, they acknowledged it was there, and they faced it down. It got, like I said, a little patronizing. There were points mm -hmm. where they were teaching people how to take their trash bags out to the curb, but they worked at it. And then what happened was the city changed around Yonkers. So mm -hmm. it's, it's younger. An awful lot of the people who most objected to this have moved or died, to put it mm. bluntly. Um, the as with almost every other city in the country, it's being its new population is far more multicultural, far more <sighs> multiracial, um, and so the housing doesn't. You know, it, it's that it was ever this big a deal is stunning. So Yonkers is, is a success story. So you, you've become a celebrity now. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. uh, you've become a celebrity. In, no. in one bar in Yonkers, look yes. At, look, look. <laughs> um, but, but, no, follow me. You, you no, become, really, they you, gave you, me you, free beer. <laughs> <laughs> you want, yeah, he didn't touch it. No, you want he his didn't. Sweet I know, I can, I can, I can. Uh, we're not advertised. Coke well. is not a sponsor here, but this is Albania. In okay. any case, you are, you you become a celebrity who's seen as has, has someone has caught you know took a snapshot captured uh, all of this dimension and now I'm interested in jumping into today. Mm -hmm. So you've got Chappaqua out there. You've got this uh, Supreme Court ruling on a Texas affordable housing plan. So it it seems to be ginning up now for a it new is, set of battles. It is ginning right? up for a new set of battles. So are people coming to you to say, will yes. you write our script or will you uh, no. consult? No. Um, um, people. But are, as you're going into these battles, what do you see? People are coming to me to say, can you believe it sounds the same? Mm. Um, again, while we were filming this, they had a standoff in front of um, the Clinton's house right. in Chappaqua, and, and the current county executive um, held a press conference, and the things he was saying about a, you know, the, the court ordered affordable housing, and we're talking affordable housing here as opposed right. to low income housing, right. which was Yonkers, and, and that is what set, that, that word set people off. Um, he was saying many of the same things that you're hearing in, in those crowds that are screaming, and that was not an exaggeration and, of those and crowds. And he was elected and by he, a two for one Democrat yeah, yeah, district. Yeah, he was, he was overwhelmingly elected, and he was saying those people they're coming here, they're coming here, and they're coming to a street near you. I mean, the, uh, those are not For the exact record, we quotes, did invite but they're him pretty close. to speak today uh, and didn't hear back. But I just want to be <laughs> did, on the record. Did you, we we, you really we did, did invite him. Yeah, we really did invite him. We uh, uh, were interested, as we always are, in having uh, all sides, but they didn't uh, seek to join us. So, uh, but I, I think when you hear someone repeating a lot of these things and basically setting up what obviously is going to be some form of train wreck down the road, do you think we've got the maturity now among stakeholders to work this out, or do you think you just basically follow, you know, we'll, 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 we'll be seeing the remake of your film and I, book? I uh, like to think that the story of Yonkers is out there as a cautionary tale, mm. I, and I like to think, I, I like, I want to try and spread the word that it can work. It wasn't perfect. Those, those townhouses need a whole lot of work now. There's an estimate that they need $67,000 per unit in mm -hmm. order to upgrade them and, and fix what's happened to them in 23 years. 
but you know, think of what you've put into the average home in 23 years. It's well right. more in many cases than $67,000, and they've had almost no work. They were built by the lowest bidder, as mm. is the problem with so much in government. All of that aside, there are, you know, the worst didn't happen. So is that a success? Well, crime didn't spike. Um, housing prices didn't plummet. The, when we, one of the first days of filming, I was standing in front of the set where they were, it was move in day in the miniseries, and they we were standing on a street of townhouses. Mm -hmm. And one of the young women who plays one of the, the new, one of the tenants in Show Me Hero came over to me and said, so where are the actual townhouses? And I said, you're, you're standing in front of them. And she turned around and she says, oh, this was what all the fuss was about? I mean, they so blended in to that street that she had no idea that she was standing in front of public housing. So it's worked in all of those ways. And yet, the fundamental fear of other, uh, the, the idea that everything you own almost literally is poured into this piece of property and someone is now going to come and dilute the value of that property, the, the feeling that you know, home should feel completely safe and now it feels a little less safe and you're not quite sure why, I mean, all of those are still true. I love this line that you shared about the HBO series. You said the filmmakers did stick with the book completely. You said that the, the, the which took restraint and, and that according to my team, um, they added a little bit of sex and some cursing, but they really didn't need to create scenes of violence because they were all part of the story. Yeah, yeah, the, um, and so you started by showing, um, now that you know all the background, that scene was, there were 250 extras screaming their heads off and it was about 97 degrees inside because they taped the windows closed for the lighting. And in 1988, they closed the windows because they were screaming outside and they were trying to, to block it. But still, the windows were closed. The room was full. People were yelling. Paul Haggis was standing did on a chair. Did you make a cameo appearance? Directing. I did not. I, I never, never got myself in. Uh. Uh, union rules. And, I, and at what point Oscar Isaac is like, trying to be heard over this crowd. Right. And he realizes that this is what it felt like to be the mayor. This is what it felt like to be Nick Wasisco. And actually Nick's widow, not to spoil anything, but mm -hmm. Nick's widow was standing, his actual widow was standing in the back and she had to talk the actor through how you face down a crowd like that because mm -hmm. he was so rattled by what it had really felt like. And then I was in the bus coming back from lunch that day with the extras, and I kind of congratulated them on their venom and vitriol. And, <laughs> and they started telling me how they were at the original meetings. Oh, interesting. So, oh. The, and I did not get into the psychological disconnect between playing yourself as an abject racist when you in <laughs> fact were, <laughs> but they were, they, that was they so and real. It was in yes, there, that really that is in their so head. real, and it got that bad. Look, I want to open up the audience for a minute, but I want to do something delicate here, um, as I love this gentleman's question a moment ago about HUD organizing HUD retirees. But but how many of you worked for HUD? Have worked for HUD in the past? Okay, so I say this with the greatest amount of respect, and you can take me on later. But in the history of HUD, and it's not meant any of you. My sense from a lot of friends that worked with HUD is it was one of the bleakest places because it was one in, in government, looking at government service, that people looked at HUD uh, and, 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 and were worried about performance, worried these controversial decisions. It just was, I mean, was it fun to work there when you worked there? Actually, I was there during the golden age of HUD. The golden age. And what was that? Did anybody work there when it sucked? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I was there yeah, just, from 1969 yeah. to 1972. Right. And my name's Carlos Campbell, and I worked for Sam Jackson, and the Nixon secretary, yes, yeah, yeah. during the Nixon years, and the secretary was jo George Romney. He was the only secretary. George Romney. Oh, interesting. Yeah, he's the only secretary in the history of HUD hmm. that had the balls to go after the, segrega uh, the segregationists. He tried to take on Warren, Michigan, and Nixon stopped him from, you know, having the AG back him up because Warren would not allow, you know, federal programs. Right. But under, two more things, under Romney, we actually launched Operation Breakthrough, which basically 
reflected the resistance in the building industry to uh, factory housing. We also right. launched a new communities program, which Nixon stopped because they wouldn't give us the money to yeah. build new towns. And, and, you know, places like Reston and Columbia work from a standpoint of integration. Right. But after that, the federal government, every single president, including the current mm -hmm. president, was totally against massive support of backing up the Fair Housing uh, Act. Mm -hmm. I happen to have been one of the principal cases in the Fair Housing Act. So I know mm -hmm. the history quite well. Fascinating, I'm really grateful for you putting that site in. I would love to go to everyone who is there, but it's gonna be tough. But my question, sort of bouncing off of, what do you, is your name? Carlos. Car Carlos, yeah. Carlos Campbell. Uh, jumping off of Carlos's point, but also reflecting on what Secretary Castro just shared. I'm interested, given your survey of, 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 of this terrain now, what would an enlightened HUD do? What does it need to get the next 20 or 30 years right that it's not doing today? Or do you look at it as inconsequential to these bigger tectonics? Well, it was extremely consequential to the beginning of, of the piece we're talking about. I mean, HUD brought the suit. Now, HUD brought the suit in 1980, and that was as Reagan was coming into office. Mm. And it was, you know, and then an administration had to fight a suit that essentially it didn't believe, believe in, in right. anymore. So those politics were interesting. Um, I was fascinated hearing him say that it couldn't come from the top down anymore. Yeah. Um, and I agree with that. I think that that was, I, I think the fact that a federal judge was ordering this became sort of the distraction, the straw man, the, the, the scapegoat, um, and it allowed this to go on, the fight to go on for longer than it did. Now, my question to him would have been, okay, so what if, he says it should be enlightened mayors and enlightened mm -hmm. Councils, yeah, but what if you have one like that? And I'm not quite clear what the answer to that is. Fascinating. Let me take one more comment or question. The audience. Anyone on this side? Do you have a comment or question? Way over here. Yeah, Far right. But let me get you a microphone because millions are watching online. <laughs> I've been at HUD since 1978, and I can tell you there were a lot of leaders. Uh, Patricia Roberts Harris. Uh, Moon Landrew, uh, and, and your issue as to how we pursued uh, the case during the Reagan period and during the terrible years of Sam Pierce was because the litigation arm was separate. We had a judge. We would say that, excuse me, we can't get political. But I also would like to argue that Jack Kemp was incredible, mm -hmm. that Henry Cisneros, who was Julian's mentor, was, was, was a star. Andrew Cuomo so, did the so right let thing. let me ask you a question. No, 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 don't, don't take it. Let me ask you a question. Uh, and, and we'll wrap it up um, with response here. But, but take the personalities out for a minute. There are probably 10 things you might think uh, would make HUD's efficacy better. Take the top two. If you were to sort of change the institution, its efficacy on these issues, what would two of those things be? Okay, I'll just say uh, <coughs> disparate impact was really important. Sean Donovan didn't get around to it. Mm. Julian is much more political than Sean, who was a policy person. I think you know that's really incredible, and for sure, I'm motivating the staff. I mean, the staff believes in the mission and has had so many obstacles uh, towards performing its mission. Thank you for your observation. Do you have any thoughts? Final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I I would have listed. I don't know about the internal, because I, I never worked at HUD, but the two things that happened this summer, the, the, dis the you know, Supreme Court and then the HUD, I don't know that it was follow-up, I think it was simultaneous. Um, I, I don't think HUD's irrelevant. I think that mm -hmm. those two things will likely make a huge difference going forward. Lisa Belkin, thank you so much. Lisa Belkin, <laughs> Chief National Correspondent of Yahoo News, and author and consultant of the HBO miniseries, Show me a hero. Lisa, great. Thank you very much.